Good to see you this morning. Aren't you glad you've chosen to start this week out the right way? I remind you once again, as I have often, that this is not the last day of the week. This is the first day of the week. This is not the weekend. This is the week beginning. And that's where the world misses it all too often, isn't it? And here we are, worshiping the Lord together. What a great way to start our week. And uh, I can't imagine starting it any other way. Amen? Well, we're in a series of messages uh, that I want to be sharing with you today that we're starting for the next couple of Sundays, and we'll see how long it goes, depending on how, we, how well we listen. Amen? I don't know if you heard the story about the notorious miser in the community. He was a tightwad of all tightwads. Uh, in fact, there was a chairman of this little community that ran the community charities. And he knocked on the door of this miser one day and said, Sir, uh, our records show that despite your tremendous wealth, you have never once given to any of the charities that we represent. He kind of snarling back at him and said, well, do your records also show that I have an elderly mother who was left penniless when my father died? And then he scowled some more. Do your records show that I have a disabled brother who can't work, can't make it? And do your records show that I also have a widowed sister with children who can barely make their ends meet? And do they even show that the neighbor across the street can't afford to buy a loaf of bread? volunteer kind of embarrassed. He said, well, well, no, sir, our records don't show those things. He said, well, I don't give to any of them, so I'm not giving to you either. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the way some people live their lives, isn't it? It's all about me. It's all about what I can, what I can get out of the deal. I've, I've preached. Uh, I figured the other day I sat down and looked at my preaching schedules for the last several years. And from, for the last five years, if you count Sundays and Wednesdays, I've preached to you approximately uh, four or five hundred times within that general range. I know, I'm tired too. <laughs> That's a lot of sermons. So I went back and speaking about stewardship today, I thought, how many times have I actually preached on that in the last few years? The last five years I went back. In 2011, in January of 2011, I preached three messages called Surviving the Financial Crunch. In 2012, uh, I preached two sermons on, on stewardship. In 2013, I preached two more sermons called Taking Care of Business and the Giving Principles. In 2014, I only preached one sermon. It was called Living in Contentment, learning how to be content with the things that God's blessed you with. In 2015, I preached no sermons on the topic of stewardship. For all you who think I speak and preach on money way too much, Take that. <laughs> that's a very, that's not even 10%. You know, barely makes into the single digit percentages of how often that that's now. Doesn't mean I haven't mentioned it at other times, but it's certainly not been the center of discussion or the focus of our discussion. And after looking at that closely like I did, I felt like I've really failed you in this regard by not mentioning it more often. And the reason I don't preach that many topical messages dealing with it, because for the most part, Folks at Believers Fellowship have learned how to be faithful and learned how to give. But at the same time, I'm also cognizant of the fact that every area of our Christian walk in life is repeated many, many times over throughout the scriptures. Whether it's on being faithful with our time and having a commitment to the word of God and the importance of reading and studying and meditating and memorizing the scripture or whether it's the part about being faithful in our fellowship and being part of our church or learning what our spiritual gifts are. All those things are things we talk about repeatedly and, and consistently in, in accordance with the scripture that God is always reminding and teaching his, his children about. Uh, the apostle Peter says, I want to stir up your minds again by way of remembrance. In other words, I talked to you about this before, I'm talking to you about it again. The apostle Paul on several occasions said, hey, we've dealt with this, but now I want to deal with it again. I want to speak to you about this one more time. Because it is our nature to be forgetful. It is our nature that if we're not encouraged or reminded in some areas, we get lax or we get lazy and we get, you know, we fall behind in those areas. So good, faithful preaching, always, always taking us through all the teaching and all the elements of the Word of God so as to remind us to always continue to be faithful. In the New King James Concordance, if you just looked it up, there's some 277 verses on belief. There's about 340 verses on prayer, 518 verses that mention love, and there's 1,439 verses that talk about giving. 
So why does God got to, why does God say so much in his word about giving? Because it's important. If you follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, about half the parables he speaks are dealing with money. One out of every six verses in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of every six of those is dealing with the Lord Jesus speaking to his people about learning to be faithful stewards, learning how to faithfully manage what God has given to them and the importance of it in their life. God knows the influence that our culture holds over us, especially in regards to money and the world holds over us. The Bible talks about the love of money being the source or the root of all evil. It's that it's, it just expresses in more than any other way probably uh, our selfishness. We can, we can gauge our, our finances and look and see how much of our life is just really about us. It, it's an important topic. As we approach 2016, we talked about the last Sunday even, uh, talking about the Corinthians, how they needed to hear the Word of God and be back into the Word of God and not to be carnal, but they needed to, needed to start maturing. I think this is an area as well as all those things we've talked about that needs to be reminded of and that we need to constantly be growing in and constantly be reminded of because it is in our old nature to be selfish. It is in our old nature to, to, to let our life just center around us and we forget what God's up to. So we look, as we look at 2016 and we're gonna decide what we're gonna do with our life in 2016, I don't know about you, but I, I want 2016 to be an impactful year for the glory of God. I, I want to grow in grace. I want to be used by God this year. I want to win more people this year to Jesus than I've ever won before. How about you? Amen? Uh, those are the things I want. So those are the things I, I need encouragement in. I want to give more money this year than I've given before. I want to help more people than I've helped before. I want to invest more in the kingdom of God than what I've invested before. I, I don't want to look at last year and see that I was more committed last year than I am this year or that I love Jesus more last year than I did this year. Amen? So I think it's important that we get into these areas and as much as some people don't like it and some people think that I, if all I talk about is money, then uh, wake up and s smell the dollars or the roses. Now, there's this passage in, in Corinthians that kind of puts a, the, the nail, you know, the, the hammer right onto the top of the nail head for me to, as I talk about this. And it's a story about a, a gracious testimony that Paul's giving to the Corinthian church about the Macedonians. And the Macedonians were a poor church. Macedonia, we know, uh, modern Macedonia would be Bulgaria, and it's the southern parts of, right, right below there in the early upper parts of Greece. So that was the area known as Macedonia. These people were tremendously and incredibly, you know, beautiful people in the way they lived their life and loved Jesus. But on the other hand, financially, they were people who were strapped. They were people who lived in difficult conditions. And Paul's talking about this. And as he opens the passage, you know, he's talking about how, how they decided they were going to do something for the glory of God and make a difference. And Paul said it was a testimony of God's grace. In fact, the sermon series I want to share with you this, the next couple of Sundays, it, it, I'm entitled it, Giving Up or Give Up. All too often... We don't do that. Now, this has double meaning, obviously. One, we need to give up and let God take control of our lives in every area of our lives, but also has to do with the fact that we need to learn how to give up, how to make eternal investments, how to give into the things that are bigger than us and the greater than us, the, the things of God that, that God is doing in the world today. So there's the idea that we're going to give up. Now, we, we understand the giving out. We give out all the time. We, we give out to our kids. We give out to family members. We give out to the water bill and the electric bill and all those things. We're always give, giving out. Sometimes we give out to beneficial things and other issues, but you'll notice the difference in investing in kingdom causes versus just giving to charitable things that the world has to offer. And I invest in some of those things that I, that I think are important that I, that, that I feel like the Lord would have me do. So there's things that my family or like wounded warriors, some of those things that we want to invest in. But that's not the giving that, that, the, that I'm talking about with giving up. Giving up means that there's a portion of my giving, portion of my income that goes into the kingdom. That's giving up. That's, that's, that's doing something on the eternal level, all right, that's making a difference of changing people's lives in the world around us and making a difference for the glory of God. So I want to look at my giving this year, whatever I'm doing, make sure I'm giving up. I know I don't have any trouble giving in. That's to myself. <laughs> giving what I want, you know. Uh, we can be a selfish people in the culture we live in. Amen. We can, we can make sure that we have all the amenities and all the comforts. All too often we believe the lie that we see in all the TV commercials. The bottom line is something like this. You need to get this luxury item. You need to buy this big ticket item. You need to get a hold of this product or you need to buy this special kind of whatever it is. And I know it's a little higher, but hey, you deserve it. 
There's the punchline, isn't it? That's the sales pitch line. You deserve it. And we look at that and we say, well, I do. I do deserve it. So that's, that's giving in in more ways than one. Hey, Amen. That also has a dual meaning. We give in to our selfishness and give in to ourselves and make sure we're investing in us. But the greatest thing that we'll invest our money in, we understand clearly if we take any time in the scriptures, is when we're learning how to give up and do something for the glory of God. Well, here's this story in the book of Corinthians where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Last week, we've been dealing with the, the carnal church at first, the first letter. This is now the second letter. And he's reminding them about something he talked to them about before when he was there. He says, now, brethren, wish to make known to you if you have your Bible open, you underline it. You can underline these words. To make known to you the grace of God. I want to tell you a story about the grace of God. Remember last week we talked about grace is not just God overlooking our sins. It's God being involved in our life. It's God demonstrating his power in our life. It's God exerting his influence and favor and blessings in our life. He said, I want to tell you a story about the grace of God. This miraculous move is God's spirit. Here he goes into that. We wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. And he describes them, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty. So here's affliction and there's poverty, but they're filled with joy. Overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. What does that mean? These folks gave a tremendous gift. For I testify, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we'd expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. He's saying these people who couldn't do anything did something. And not only they did, did something, they did something incredible. It was a gracious supernatural event how God moved in these people's lives and they moved in their heart. And he says, here's how they did it. Here's how they approached their giving. Here's how they approached their stewardship in life. So I think this is a good model if we want to know what it means to be a grace giver and live in that grace kind of life and expose ourselves to God so that he can be God over us and do what he wants to do in us and with us and through us. I call this the, the, the Macedonian method for, for, for giving. If you want to look at how you're going to give in 2016, you might look and see what the Macedonians did. It wasn't a light issue. This was an important thing for them. And you can tell by the way it's written here that it was something they took the time to give thorough consideration to of what is God doing and what is God saying. How do you get to that point of saying, this is the way I want to do it? I think the first step in all of this is, there it is. The first step in all this is, is that first step is that there's that point of want to. You gotta want to. You gotta make your mind up that you wanna give before you decide what to give. There's a lot of people who don't get to want to. You know, they just, they don't ever get to that place. They really don't want to support. They don't want to tithe. They don't want to support missions. They don't wanna participate. And they, and I would say that's not the majority of Believer's Fellowship. Most of you want to. You want to, but there are those who have never got to the place of saying, you know, bless God, I wanna do something for, it makes a difference. They haven't discovered that. And I, for a long time, I, I was puzzled by that. Why is it? And I, not that I don't think they're saved and that manifests the fact that they're not saved because I know saved people who are miserly like that. They don't understand the principles. And I got to see, I think it really gets to this. They don't have a vision of what God is doing. And they don't have the vision that God wants to use them to do it. All they can see is this little small dimension that they live in and they never see outside of the horizon of their own life to see God's up to something. God is doing some things. I'm going to ask you, I mean, do you have a vision for what God is doing right now in the world, in your life? I mean, most people don't realize that the gospel is, is still going out to, to the world. It's going out to more countries than it has at any other time. It's being expressed in more languages than it has at any other time. There's, there, it's been, been introduced to more people groups, the gospel has, than it has at any other time in history. We're seeing an apex in mission work and, and outreach around the world. I mean, there are people out there today and we don't realize it, how dependent they are upon us for us just to be faithful and continue to do what God has called us to do. The people of Israel, I think what made them unique is God calls you know, Abraham and basically what he tells Abraham, you are a chosen people. I've got something I'm going to do in the world through you. 
In the New Testament, it's the same thing. God says, now, I've raised up my church. There are chosen people. I've got something I'm going to do in the world through you. And we don't realize that uniqueness. I, I think that pretty much Israel began to see it as they went, went through the journey, you know, all the pestilence upon the Egyptians and, you know, the, the gnats and flies and frogs, you know, and all those things, and ultimately the death of the firstborn, and, and then to head out towards the desert and the Red Sea split wide open. They start getting the picture that God's got something he wants to do, right? God's got something special going on. My goodness, look at all God's done for you. Look at the deliverance. Look at the healing. Look at the grace. Look at the mercy. Look at his divine hand in your life. And it's been done in so many ways. But yet we get blind. We just don't see what God is up to. And I think when we do, guess what? Then we want to. We discover, hey, I really am, you know. It's just like the song we just sang. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. But hey, I'm who I am because he's up to something. I've been chosen. I've been called. I'm here to be the light. I'm here to be the salt. I'm here to make the difference of the world. They don't, they don't catch that. The second part of this is, do you, do you have a vision for what God's doing in our church? I mean, God is doing things. People's lives are being touched. People's homes are being affected. People's hearts are being touched. We're going to do greater things. We will do greater things as we get the mindset, I want to be a part of something. I want to see lives changed. I mean, there are events that we have put even on our schedule that are coming up in this spring. There will be life transforming events, but you're going to have to step up and say, I want to be that. Whether it's a men's conference or the women's conference or any other things that are happening. It's camp, it's mission. I want to do something. I don't want to sit here and watch what everybody else does. I want to be the difference maker. I'm going to be that guy who starts reaching out and reaching other men for Christ. I'm going to be that woman who's going to reach out and reach other women for Christ. I'm not going to sit here on my blessed assurance and do nothing. I want to. I want, this is the difference here. Do we have an idea? Do we have an idea what God's doing in, in your own life? Do you understand that he wants to use you? Do you comprehend the fact that when we preach this issue about God using our time, our talents, and our treasures, what that means is God wants to use you. You're the one who's been put in stewardship. You're the one who's in guardianship over your time and your talent and your treasures. You're the one who holds the key to all those things. And you have to get in your mind, I am a part of a kingdom and it is bigger than me. I can't even comprehend it, it is so big. It is global, it is reaching around the world. It is eternal, it makes a difference for all eternity. And I'm part of that, you're part of that. It's bigger than all of us. We ought to be challenged by that. And I think when we get our eyes open and we allow the challenge of God to fall on our hearts, it begins to bring up a, a breaking and we say, thank you, Jesus. I'm humbled by the fact that you would call me. I want to do it. I want to be a part of it. We would often mention the story of Isaiah in chapter six, where he said, I saw the glory of God. What happened? He got a vision of what God was doing. God said, I'm looking for someone to sin. Isaiah, in his brokenness, I'm, I'm worthy. I'm not, I'm, I'm not worthy now. I'm, I'm unholy. And here he is when God says, whom shall I send? He springs to his feet, raises his hands and says, I want to, I want to give, I want to go, I want to help, I want to sacrifice. I think that's, that's the biggest part of where the Macedonians were. You get to that, they, they saw the need and the need that Paul was talking to the Macedonians and to the Corinthians about was the need to help the saints who were suffering tremendous persecution. They were being destroyed, their lives were being taken, they were being fed to the lions. I mean, the Romans were doing everything they could to make the Christians' lives, especially in Jerusalem, as miserable as possible. Many of them were losing their lives. Said, we need to help these people. We want to be a part of the ministry to them as our brothers and sisters of Christ. Let us be a part. Let, we want to do something. Hey, but excuse me, I can't do anything. I'm deeply afflicted. <laughs> I'm deeply impoverished. It's said right there in Scripture. I don't know. Well, that kind of brings me to the next step. First step is want to. The second step is able to, you know. After deciding, hey, I want to do something, you have to get to that point of, well, am I, am I really able? If you're breathing oxygen in this room right now, any kind of format of air, and you're exhaling it, and your heart is beating, then you're able to. No limitations here. We're all able to do something. If you sit around out of fear, or just the mindset, I can't, I can't, I can't, it won't work, and you want me, I'm not good enough. Hey, if you live with that little tiny limited mindset, then you won't experience this kind of grace that he's talking about. A lot of people say, I want to, but they're, they're kind of like those folks say, well, I haven't ever gotten around to it. You know, I may do that this year. You know, it's kind of like the weight loss resolution. 
You know, <laughs> I'm going to do that this year. But this goes well beyond that. I mean, this text relates not only to the fact that these, the Macedonians wanted to, and it says it obviously gives a description of them. It says, where they can't, they're not able to, but they do. They do something. They become, all of a sudden, there's this ability that's found. They get around to it. And some of you may be in this room that, you, you know, you're doing without a lot less, maybe that some people other are, and some people have a lot more than you. But all of us, no matter where we're at, no matter how limited or how, or how unlimited we might be, we all have the capacity to do something and step up and do something for the glory of God. And, but there's a lot, and I've discovered just the opposite in reality when it comes to giving. A lot of people who have more give less. And those who give less seem to give more. Like that widow, you know, when Jesus standing by the treasury and she cast in just that little bit, so she gave out of her need. She had a need and she gave out of her need. She didn't give out of her abundance. She says she cast in more than everybody. She cast in the least, but she cast in the most. She gave out of a, a want in her life and a need in her life. People don't comprehend that. I always thought, man, just how rich do you have to, if you're rich and you don't give, how rich do you have to be before you can give? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, unfortunately, that's, it's, just, it's usually the, those who are limited and resources are limited. And those people who, 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 who can't, they're the ones who end up with the can and the ones that end up doing it. And those who say they can't are the ones who have and they never experience any blessing, any grace in their life. Verse 2 about these people the Macedonians read a while ago. Talked about them being deeply impoverished. Deeply in, in need. Deeply distressed and distracted. These people are hurting. But they eagerly not only eagerly, it says they generously gave. They generously gave to the Lord. They didn't hold back. They saw and they wanted to respond. That's Macedonian generosity, all right? That's a Macedonian method for giving. That's the Macedonian mindset. That's the mindset that we all need to embrace if we're going to do what God's called us to do. The Macedonian, here's the way it works about the Macedonians. Let me go and pass that scripture. And the Macedonians, they, they determined, one, that they could do they wanted to, and they did. It says they, were, they gave as much as they were able to, Paul said. In fact, he said they gave not only what they were able to, and they gave beyond what they were able to. You say, well, Brother Joe, that just sounds dangerous. That sounds dangerous. You mean they gave more than they could? That's what it says. Well, what's that mean? It means they gave more than they could. It means they did not act logically according to the world. But I believe they act rationally and logically according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. As you look at this passage and you look, get real deliberate over it, you can see that this wasn't a light knee-jerk mindset, you know, that Paul was this great fundraiser. Man, they all ripped out their checkbooks and wrote giant checks and put in the offering what they couldn't afford to give. And checks are bouncing everywhere. That's not what happened. <laughs> You know, these people are moved by the Spirit of God. The, the Bible describes it. He said, I want to give you a witness, a testimony about the, how God moved. His grace. Remember, what grace is not overlooking. Grace, God exerting his power. How God exerted his power through these people. And how they gave, not only according to their ability, they gave beyond their ability. They wanted to give. In fact, here's what he gets down to. Not only did they want to give, they looked for ways to give. And all too often... We really don't want to give, and we certainly don't want to look for any extra ways that we might give. And what they did, they took this challenge. They, they took this need that was in the Jerusalem church, and this had been going on for several years. This is not a one-time offering, all right? This is something they made a commitment to, and they were giving to over and above their regular giving. And Paul was saying, you lay this aside along with everything else for these people. He said, I want you to, to, to give. He says, so they gave according to their ability. And I, now, don't miss this first part because this is the key here. First of all, they gave themselves to the Lord. And then they surrendered to their leadership, you know, to respond. Paul didn't tell them, here's what each one of you is supposed to give. He just said, you need to give, and you need to ask what God wants you to give. You need to look where you're at, what God's doing in your life, how God is moving in your life, and respond accordingly. Isn't that what the Bible says? That we respond accordingly? And God gives us some standards. But when, when God's people all together learn to be that they, that they are able to be generous with their material things and they begin to respond in a generous manner, guess what happens? God begins to do a work that's unique. God, God begins to do a, an incredible and special work. We have seen as a church, or anybody who's been around here any length of time, some supernatural miracles that God has performed on our behalf. And most of those times it happened when it, we couldn't afford it, when it was just not possible. 
when there was just no way for it to happen. And it happened in spite of everything because people experienced the grace of God and began to do what God called them to do and do it with a heart that was filled and full. Second Corinthians 9, a little later, Paul's talking about this. And he said, these people gave so much. He says that, that he goes through these verses. He said, the ministry of the service not only fully supplying the needs of the saints. So what's happening? He said, their needs are being supplied and God is being glorified through their generosity. He goes on to say, there are many that are giving thanksgiving to God. Verse 12 said, besides that, it proves their love for God. Verse 13 talked about, besides that, the Christians in Jerusalem, strangers, they are helping Jews and not Gentiles. The Macedonians were Gentiles. They're helping these Jews. Though, and now the Jews are beginning to pray for the churches in, in, in the Gentile countries. So what's he saying? God's moving. People's lives are being touched. People's lives are being changed. All the walls between the, the, the racial issues and the Jews and the Gentile issue and all the culture. God, it's just amazing how when God's people start being godly and start loving God and loving each other, all those barriers fall. All those barriers fall. God does something supernatural and unites the hearts and the lives of his people. And then that affects the world around them. Just because they decided, hey, we can do this. We're going to give up. The second thing the Macedonians did in this regard was that they, they reached up. They stretched beyond themselves. They gave according to ability. And it says they gave beyond their ability. I mean, is it irresponsible to give something beyond your ability? I don't think so. Not if the Lord's leading, not if God's told you to do it, not, not, not if it's God's hand upon it. I mean, how often do we see this? I, I, I was talking to one of our men in our prayer meeting this morning. He said, well, Brother Joe, he was seeking to encourage me. He says, you know, God never gives us more than we can handle. I said, God is all the time giving me more than I can handle. I said, that sounds good, doesn't it? God never gives more than we can handle. I said, but you have to understand what you're saying before you just throw out that little bit of advice. Everything in our life, if we try to do it without God, we can't handle it. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And I know, I know that messes up a nice little story. And I was trying to, I, I was a lot nicer when I was explaining the difference of opinion than I'm just saying right now, all right? So for those who hurt for people when I talk about them, you know, they're okay. <laughs> all right? And it was a learning moment for all of us, all right? But the idea is, yes, there's all the time God's putting things that we, we don't know how to deal with. I, I know, with you? But that's, this is what Paul's talking about. The message. Grace comes. That's the beauty of it. We're not left to ourselves. We have grace. And Paul was saying, you know, hey, God gave me grace. Remember when he talks about he had this thorn in his flesh? You know, that's about the only passage in Scripture where I see Paul really praying for his own personal needs. If you look at all the prayers of Paul... They're all kingdom-centered. They're all about bless the church, open the eyes of the church, reach out, open the doors of ministry, give us boldness in, in reaching the world. It's all kingdom-related, all right? In other words, Paul, his mindset is not just about him. Uh, you know, the ordeal I'm going through, and Kathy and I were talking about this this week. I said, you know, all too often we're focused on our need, what we can, you know, got, you know, Kathy's heart situation. We need you to do something there. I have a little sciatica coming on. You know how that is. Well, Lord, me. We pray about, Lord, we have a financial need. How many prayers this week did you offer on behalf of others or for yourself? It was all about these kind of things. I am not saying don't pray about those things, all right? I'm just saying when you pray for these things, you keep in mind the kingdom. It may well be that God doesn't fix something, but there's a reason behind it. You know, I think what's happening is, 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 is we learn how to pray and we learn how to present our needs to the Lord. We can come to the place of liberty and freedom in our life. We can say, Lord, okay, here's what I, I believe is your will. But if it's not your will, then make it count. Make it count for the kingdom. Make it count for the greater cause of Christ. Make it count out in the world. Let it be a testimony of your power. Make it, make it, make it effective in people's lives. Do something bigger than us with it however you handle it and whatever you do with it. Make it count. I think that's the heartbeat of the Macedonians. Yeah, we got troubles, but hey, we can make something count. We can make a difference. And even we're praying for the, the things and the issues of our life. But Paul said, you know, I've asked God three times, take this away. He's, I believe he's being specific. He doesn't share with us. There's all different kinds of opinions, amen. I'm glad he didn't give us something to talk about. He didn't say what the thorn was. But obviously it was real, and obviously Satan was attacking him with it. God said, no, I want to show you something bigger and better and greater. 
This testimony is going to make a difference not only in your life because you're going to experience the power of God to overcome this issue that Satan's hitting you with. You're going to defeat him here. And at the same time, it's going to make a difference for the glory of God. It's going to count. It wouldn't count if I took it away. It wouldn't make a difference in the world. It wouldn't make a difference in the church. It wouldn't make a difference in God's will and purposes. <clears throat> so it says these people were able to come to this place where they reached up. And I think that's where we get, Lord, that whatever I do, I, I can do whatever you call me to do. He says they weren't able to do this, but they did it beyond their abilities. Does that mean what it says? Yes, it means they, they did what, what they couldn't do by the grace of God. I mean, it, it sounds to me today, if you compare these churches with modern churches today, they're just two different extremes and there's two different worlds apart. And what, what happened with the Macedonians when they give like that? If I give beyond what I'm able to do, what am I doing? Well, if I'm a lost person, I just think I'm being stupid. But if I'm a saved person, I realize the scriptures are true and I can do whatever God tells me to do. Because Paul had already told him that the God has promised to give seed to a sower so that his needs are met so that he can give away to others. In fact, he told him in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God will bless you with what you need so that you have all that you need and you also have enough left over to make a difference. He said, he put it this way, to be faithful to every good work. That good work represents the kingdom. That good work represents the will of God and the purposes of God in the world around us. So you make a difference. So they, they gave up. They realized, and they wanted to. And not only did they, they, they give up, they, 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 they reached up. What happens after that? They had to trust God to reach up, didn't they? I think you get to this point where you realize, uh, let me just read this quote to you that, that I put here. It says, the whole idea behind this kind of commitment process is we learn to trust God for tomorrow, for the future. And giving up beyond their ability means they had to trust God for tomorrow. And we're living in a time, we're kind of reverting back to some crisis times of back 2011 when I talked about surviving the crunch. There's, there's a crunch going on especially in, when the, ec the economy and parts of the world we live in are, are energy related. <laughs> and people are being laid off. You, you may not have been affected by it, but there's tens of thousands of people in our own community in Houston who've been affected by it, lost their jobs, laid off people, wondering where it's going to happen tomorrow. And you may be in some other industry and it may be surviving, but you have to realize the world's not about you. And we, but we think, what happens if that comes to me? What if my sector, what if my world, or what if my economy is affected by those things eventually? Then what about me? Who are you going to trust for your future then? You know, we used to live in a world when everybody had these jobs. They just went to work for one company and were in that company the rest of their life. And they retired with a big retirement. That world's gone away. That world has slowly faded away. It's just not around where it used to be. It's time Christians learn how to trust God for the present as well as for the future. I heard this professional golfer say one time, he says, I'm trying to arrange my life. That's the way some people think. I want to arrange my life so that the, that the day I die is the same day my money runs out. Now, I used that mindset, and I thought, okay, I can die right after lunch next Tuesday. <laughs> no, we trust God. We believe God. You know, and it takes wisdom from the scripture. It takes wisdom from the spirit of God. It takes counsel. It takes sincere prayer. I think there was where the Macedonians were, they wasn't just a stupid decision. They sought God's face. They knew what God wanted them to do and they did what God told them to do. I mean, it's a biblical principle in, in scripture though, that if we just keep sowing, we keep giving, God's going to keep giving the harvest we need so we can always have what we need and always have enough left over to give away. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, you'll be enriched in every way so you can be made generous on every occasion. Your generosity was a result in the thanksgiving to God. In other words, I'll give you what you need. He provides seed for the sower. No matter how limited I am, I may not have a big bag of seed as the next guy, but I have enough seed to meet my need and enough left over to give away. If I at one point say, I'm not going to give away anything, guess what happens? The seed I do have begins to diminish. So what do I need to do? I need to give up and reach up. And mostly, this is the last and third point. I, you know, I need to step up. The Macedonians, what did they do? They, they did. They stepped up. 
I want to, their generosity grew out of the willingness to just say, hey, we want to step up. We want to take personal responsibility for what God is doing in the world today. We want to take place in what's happening. We don't want to be left out. It says they beg for participation. What are they saying? God is doing something. We want to be a part of it. That's powerful, isn't it? Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you be a part? And so many of you have discovered what that means. When God is doing something, we should want to be right in the middle of it. There are things that really pull the strings of my heart and, and, and really deal with me. And it's usually the very things that, 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 that I notice that draw my, that get my attention, things that are things that are making a difference in people's hearts and in people's lives. Too many people, they won't get to this point where they just step up, you know, and, and, and make the difference. You want God to bless what you're doing in every area of your life? Then you have to learn how to be this giver in life. In all these levels, from your professional life, your public life, your emotional life, your spiritual life. You have to learn how to let God be God over these areas of your life. Learn how to give up. Not just give in, not just give out. But learn how to give up. Don't be like the guy who fell off the 50 foot ladder and didn't get a scratch. I hear about that guy? Not one, didn't break a bone, didn't break a rib, didn't get a bruise. He was only on the second step. <laughs> Safe, no risk there, there's no problems. You know, I, 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 this is as far as I'm going. I'm not gonna climb that ladder. I'm not going to step out on that limb. Listen, out on the limb, that's where all the fruit is. Out on the limb, that's where grace is. But whatever you're dealing with and whatever you're going through, I can guarantee you God will meet you there if you're following him. If you're following him. God supplies what we need as we believe, as we trust, and as we obey, and as we respond. I love what Bill Stafford used to teach on giving. He said, you know, he said, what God wants to do with our life, he wants to make us a warehouse of distribution. He stores here what we need. We choose how we're going to respond to that as, as the manager of this warehouse. But realize that God has, has us as a point of not just storage, it's distribution. It's moving forward. God will meet you there. I read an article the other day that said, if, if churches in America... Those, in the regular attendance, not all the membership, but the people who regularly attend church in America would just give the biblical standard of giving like 10%. You know, it's, it's just a standard that Scripture shows us. It said that would cause an excess of $140 billion over the year in funds. $140 billion. Can you imagine what could be done with $140 billion in mission work in reaching the lost? and touching people's hearts and lives, and ministering. That's powerful, isn't it? I can't make up the 140 billion, and neither can you. But you can do what God's called you to do. Do what you're able to do, and beyond what you're able to do. Hey, that by first giving yourself to the Lord. And that's, what's that mean? That means that, you know, hey, my finances are part of the package there. Now, I'd say, I would say probably from the majority of the folks at Believer's Fellowship, this message is kind of redundant, so to say. But I think it's the message we need to hear to remind us, to keep us from getting stagnant and sterile in our lives, and keep us excited about what God is doing. And He wants to use me, and He wants to use you in getting it done. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, I'm not going to give an invitation, but we'll take an offering. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And the offering receptacles are where they are every Sunday. And I would pray that before you leave here today, you give as God has led you to give. And you realize that God is using you in part of a greater thing. And probably even collectively, we probably don't realize how big it is. You know, if we put all our minds together, we still probably wouldn't comprehend at all of what God is doing. But he's a good, good father. And he's about a great, great work. And we need to learn how to give up. Amen and give to the greater cause. But I am going to do, though, as we close our service today, Brother Tim's going to have a few announcements in a moment. Uh, I'm going to ask my wife, Kathy, to come up here, sit on this front row right here in front of Tom Saint. Amen. I'm going to ask Tom Saint to come sit right beside her. And anybody else here today who's facing some very difficult or complicated physical issues or anything else, 
I want you to come sit right here on this front row. So don't hesitate. You say, well, you know, Brother Joe, I'm facing a surgery. I'm dealing with this or a cancer or a heart issue or whatever. Then don't sit there and be proud. Come right now. And we're going to pray for you as a church. So who else is coming? Maybe you want to come sit in for somebody. Once you, they're not here today. Maybe it's a family or relative or somebody. You come up and sit up here as well. In a moment, we're going to pray for, for all these folks. Amen? Quick update on Kathy's deal. We